Welcome to The Relevance Report, where we explore the relevant stories that are shaping our world today. I'm Christina Felker, your host this week. On today's show, we're going to hear two audio documentaries. We'll dive into the world of electric vehicles, and then we get a glimpse into what it's like to be an organic farmer in Alberta. There's an electric vehicle revolution happening. With policy shifts, more people will be getting behind the wheel of an electric vehicle, or as it's better known, an EV, sooner than you think. But is there the infrastructure to support more EVs on the road? Reporter Dreesen Blas speaks with people leading the charge for this more sustainable way of transportation. As concerns about climate change continue to mount, the need for sustainable transportation solutions has never been more critical. I'm Dreesim Blas, and I will be your guide as we delve into the world of electric vehicles and their potential to revolutionize how we travel while reducing our carbon footprint. Our journey begins with exploring the electric vehicle market and its growth trajectory. Let's explore Charge Stop's office, where I spoke with John Paul De Maria, the founder of Charge Stop, a company dedicated to advancing AV charging infrastructure to gain insights. Let's head to Charge Stop's office and meet with John Paul. Well, actually, I read an article yesterday in regards to Mercedes, Toyota, uh, all the big manufacturers, Volkswagen are expecting to have by 2030, at least in North America, 30% of its uh, core product electric vehicle and in Europe, 50%. It's, you know, uh, there's a, a slow in the growth due to the fact there's no stable and universal charging stations available and we're going to solve that problem. So it's going to help the manufacturers as well. With major automakers shifting towards electric vehicles, the landscape of transportation is undergoing a revolutionary transformation. But what inspired John Paul to establish Charge Stop and what role does it play in promoting EV adoption? You know, I see people in the EVs uh, sleeping in cars, sitting in cars, you know, undergoing a long drawn out uh, charging process now. You know, I wanted the fastest and most efficient technology that's going to allow you to charge your car as fast as possible and uh, remain safe and, you know, go and get a drink and uh, coffee or, you know, purchase a convenience product as well as go to the bathroom. You know, safety, number one, and, uh, you know, comfort, obviously. John Paul visited Tesla charging stations and inquired about the charging experience from a Tesla owner. Here is what he learned. You own a Tesla? Yeah. I and you're it. getting it charged here? Yes, sir. And uh, <laughs> so what are you doing in your car while you're, t- 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 you're charging it? Watching a movie, playing games. Watching a movie, playing games. So if you uh, had an opportunity to go someplace, have a coffee, a drink, oh, 100%. relax? 100%. I'm using the coffee at the moment. <laughs> Let's shift gears to a different setting, the Southgate Mall's parking lot on the first level. Here among the Tesla supercharging stations, I've encountered Scott Cooper, a Calgary resident who travels a lot with his Tesla. Scott shares his experiences navigating the challenges of EV owners in a province where infrastructure remains light just the number of stations so we're used to gas stations that are everywhere but you really have to plan your trips with charging especially uh, like being a a Tesla like there's only two or three Tesla uh, superchargers in the city up here in Edmonton and that makes it just much harder to to get around and find a place to charge. When asking Scott about Charge Stop's vision in integrating the EV charging stations with convenience store Scott said Tesla charging, like right now, I know this is a podcast, but right now we're just in a parking garage. Whereas we're used to gas stations where you can hop out and you get a drink, go to the bathroom, whatever. Um, It would be great if the infrastructure was around the charging stations as well. Because usually what I'll end up having to do is like run across the street to a gas station to like 
like do all the things that I would do at a gas station and then go back to the charging one. So if that could be better incorporated, it'd be perfect. As we explore the challenges in establishing charging infrastructure, John Paul sheds lights on the importance of addressing public perception and reliability issues. The number one challenge is public perception would be the first thing in regards to electric vehicles. You know, it was slowly uh, people are coming to terms with it. There's no real complaint about the car. Actually, the cars, you know, from Tesla down to BMW, everybody raves about the car. They get five-star reviews. The issue is uh, the charging. And uh, again, it all goes back to providing a fast, reliable charging system, which is uh, what we're going to provide, which is up from minus 45 degrees centigrade to positive 45 degrees centigrade with a 99.5% uptime. So somebody's going to be able to go and just uh, drive their car with uh, confidence and be able to come and uh, plug in with us and solve the problem. But what does the future hold for EV charging accessibility and efficiency? John Paul offers his perspective on the evolving landscape of electric vehicle charging. Tesla announced they're going to build a $25,000 car. BYD already builds a $20,000 car. You know, they're, they're, the plan is uh, it was more for the upper middle class and the affluent, but now the EV makers are, you know, going after the everyday consumer with a wonderful product at a great price. And uh, the efficiency is when we build our, our charging structures, we're going to solve the reliability issues that people are going to have. Jerry Antflick, the fleet manager at West Edmonton Hyundai, offers insights into the broader trends shaping EV adoption in Edmonton. Uh, electric cars, the sales have increased over, let's say, the last number of years. But over the last couple of months, maybe because of climate, maybe because of weather, maybe because of the infrastructure, you're finding that the number of electric cars being sold right now is slowly decreasing just because of there's no infrastructure or facilities for them right now. Here in the city, it's hard to find, okay? There's lots of things for Tesla, but if you're driving just an ordinary electric vehicle, whether you're getting it from Hyundai or Toyota or Ford or wherever, there isn't a lot of stations that you can go in and plug it in. As we explore the challenges in establishing charging infrastructure, John Paul emphasizes the significant benefits of EVs and their positive environmental impacts, which includes reducing carbon emissions and combating climate change. You saw a rebirth of, uh, you know, plants and animals and endangered species and you know, the earth started to come back to where it was. Uh, you know, there's no, you don't have to believe in a climate denier or whatever to understand that the earth is changing climate-wise and uh, carbon is a big factor in it. I believe that, you know, if we reduce it responsibly, that uh, we're going to give our uh, earth and our home a, a wonderful uh, opportunity to thrive. As we conclude our journey, it's evident that the future of electric vehicles holds a huge potential but also significant challenges with innovative solutions like those offered by Charles Stop, advocating for improved infrastructure. The roads ahead promise to be electrifying. Thank you for joining me today. This is Dries Imdlas, McEwen University, Edmonton. Organic farming in Alberta is a unique undertaking that comes with its own challenges. From the weather to overproduction and turnover of staff, organic farming isn't for the faint of heart. I spoke with the people who produce and buy organic goods to get a better understanding of the ins and outs of this industry. People are spilling in and out of the old Strathcona farmers markets on a sunny spring Saturday morning in the Wide Avenue neighborhood. The smell of freshly made popcorn lingers in the air. Walking through the bustling crowds, maneuvering around large strollers and groups of people, you get drawn into colorful stalls that are stocked with fresh produce, from perfectly rolled lettuce hats to various meat selections and handmade crafts that catch your eye. The atmosphere feels relaxed and communal, as the voices of people are overlapping and you hear the music of a live band playing in the distance. 
In the midst of the crowds, I spoke with Dory, who shops here regularly and sees great value in purchasing products directly from the farmers. Honestly, we vote with our money. I think it's absolutely critical. So if you're supporting local, you're supporting your local farms, you're keeping the economy here. So I think it's absolutely critical to support our farmers and the farmers specifically that align with your values. I see the value, so I'm willing to pay for that value. Just 45 minutes outside of the city, I spend an afternoon at the Sunworks farm of Ron and Sheila Hamilton to connect with the farmers who do things differently, running a values-based operation and farm of integrity in a non-conventional way. Farmer Ron speaks openly to me about their farming practice. The values we've always had since we moved here was to be organic, humane, grow good, clean, real food. That is basically the basis of what we do. Make sure the land is looked after, make sure our people are looked after, the animals are looked after, and we'll try to do as best a job as we can. Selling at a local farmer's market has many positive impacts in the development of the local community, and the relationships that are built along the way become so invaluable. Our business model is on farmer's markets and on natural foods organic stores. We don't work in the conventional industry at all. We work with a few chefs, but farmer's markets are our mainstream for our revenue in that the relationships we make at farmer's markets, they are everlasting. When COVID came, everyone didn't know in the world what was going on. And I said to Sheila, it's time to dip into our relationship bank. And because of our relationships, you know, COVID never adversely affects us at all. Among learning how to run a farming business and how to market their product in an effective way, farmers face additionally many other challenges that will require quick adaptation and solid teamwork. Yeah, farming is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> it's just because you got to deal with so many challenges and weather probably being one of the number one staff, weather, commodity boards, banking, finance. We've been challenged over the years on all of those things. And there'll be always ongoing challenges. I mean, we had a drought last year, early, early on in the year. And how are we going to keep our animals fed, especially our grass-fed animals? And we fenced off pastures. We, we found other organic land that we could graze on. We moved out animals around and one of our friends about an hour and a half away he had some land so we used his used some of his land it's a team approach it's Sheila and I and our crew we always work with our team as many hands are at play to make Sunworks operate in the way it is today Sheila shares with me her very own experiences of the challenges she feels are the hardest to deal with as she's overlooking the business and the people involved We've had, as every business, we've had our financial ups and downs, but we barrel through them. I have to make sure that there is money to pay the staff and to pay the bills. There are times that we've gone through that are rough, financially rough. Finding good labor is a huge challenge, especially in the plant. We just hire. That plant sometimes is like a revolving door. You hire somebody and they either last or they don't last, but someone else comes through the door and it's just, and then someone will stick. And paying them a fair price is very important to us. Everything has its challenges and no challenge is worse than the other because it's a domino effect. The one thing that Ron and I have always done is made sure that we are involved in all parts of the farm because we want to ensure that the staff recognize that there's no job that needs to be done here that's beneath anybody. We're all on the level playing field. We're all responsible. We're not above anybody. We're part of a team. While the climate of the mind is among the hardest things to change, we as consumers make choices every day and have more power than we realize. For every consumer, there's a different reason why they buy. It's not some like local, okay? The humane is a great part of why they buy. Some like the organic part. Some just have the relationships with us, develop the relationships with us. If you grow a product that's in demand and it's priced right uh, with the values that the consumer has, we feel that we can make a living at this. It's a challenge to make sure that everything works right. We're not competing. We have an alternative product. And right from the very beginning, that's how we've described our product. It's an alternative to the conventional system. We, we do what our thing. We do what we do best. We know what we do. We do it with honesty and integrity and quality. Economic development within the local communities ensures 
that the money remains within that cycle and farmers can make a living. Consumers have a massive role in determining the future of agriculture by making purchasing decisions that favor more regenerative farming methods. Striving for economic, environmental, and social sustainability all at the same time can be challenging, but it's possible. So sustainability is a great big word, okay? So it covers so much, and we're not greenwashing sustainability. Uh, Farming is a business. People have been raised in these businesses. They make a living, and change is hard for anybody. You know, that's one of the hardest things. We never came into this having to change. This is who we were. We've practiced regenerative agriculture right before the word was even described. We didn't have to change. Change is hard. We are one of the very few people in Canada that do what we do. Being organic, certified humane, our own processing facility. When you have those underlying goals and those values and those principles, you know, we can change. But it's very difficult for people to change. And usually organic farmers, they've grown up as organic farmers in their farm families. They've had health challenges, health scares. They all of a sudden say, I don't want to farm with herbicides, pesticides anymore. And they come to that realization. But it's not a lot of farmers who really consciously make that decision. There is no doubt that choosing to be a farmer is an enormous commitment and a labor of love. It's a 24-7, 365 job, and you have to be willing to work. It's not an easy life. And even now that we're big and I spend a lot of time in the farm office, it's still a lot of work. It's a learning curve, and you have to be open to change. Because if that doesn't work, then you have to change. You have to be able to switch on a dime in order to carry on with different aspects of how you do it. So you always have to be thinking, you have to be progressive, and you have to be able to stick with your values. The more we know about the process of farming and the food we purchase and consume, simply by having conversations in our local markets with the farmers, the more we're able to make informed decisions that have positive widespread effects. When you're shopping and you have certain values you want to encompass, there's no right or wrong value that you embrace. Just make sure that where you're buying your food embraces that. And then that will nourish you. So make informed decisions. Talk to the farmer. Ask questions. And whatever you decide is right for you is right. Sheila not only speaks passionately and openly about where their values originated from, but also talks about the extended farm family they have grown over many years at the local farmers markets. It's so important for both of us to have that connection with these people. The market children I have and the market grandchildren I have, and it's all from the second and third generations of family that have been buying our meat since these kids were born. It's very important to me to have that face-to-face contact. I stopped Simon at the Strafcona Farmers Markets as I watched him carry out two full bags of fresh produce. Alongside Sheila's words, he shares his sentiments with me. I always think it's just great to help out locals and help out the farmers around the communities. I come and shop every week. I came here as a kid. My mom brought me when I was little, and I've been bringing my kids for the last 15 years. At least I've been coming almost every Saturday. Ron and Sheila Hamilton are one example of a local farm family that has given their time and life to farming for more than two decades. Our local farmers markets are a way for us consumers to connect with the hardworking people who are growing our food, while simultaneously providing more room for the farmers to run their business and sell their products without the middleman. I was able to see and hear about these impacts. I'm your host, Christina Felker, and stay tuned until next time for more stories of Wiedersehen. Thanks for joining us for the Relevance Report. This week's episode was produced by Dreesen Blas and Christina Felker. The show was edited by Christina Felker. The show's supervising producer is Sheena Rossiter. Additional studio supervision by Sasha Stenojevic. This podcast is produced as part of the BCSC 325 Radio News and Documentaries course in the winter 2024 semester. The course is part of the Bachelor of Communication Studies program in the Department of Communication at McEwen University. The show was edited and produced out of the McEwen Media Production Studio. 
Our theme music is called Buzzing by Kaylee Lambert. Logo design for this podcast is by Sasha Stenoyevich. And I'm Christina Felker, your host for this week's episode. This podcast was recorded on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakoda Sioux. We acknowledge that the territory is home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta, regions 2, 3, and 4, within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. Don't forget to subscribe to The Relevance Report on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please leave us a review and rating. It really helps people find the show. Please join us again next week when we report the relevant stories that are shaping our world.